We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cashflow Pro, your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. I want to welcome everybody who is out there listening, as well as I would like to welcome Amanda Hahn of Keystone CPAs. Now, Amanda and I were talking a little bit prior to the show, and we've kind of bounced some ideas. Everybody wants to know about the tax benefits of investing in real estate, investing passively in real estate, how things pass through, what a K-1 is, and all of the, um, I guess, the things that surround the discussion of tax liability after investing, during investing, and so on. So, Amanda, how are you today? Welcome. I'm doing great, Casey. Thank you so much for having me here. I am really excited to, um, you know, see if I can bring value and help people use real estate to save on taxes. Oh, absolutely. We're so glad to have you here because, again, this th these are questions that come from investors basically on a, on a daily basis. How can I save taxes? How does investing in real estate save taxes? Now, we all know, uh, or I guess we've all heard of the form K-1. It's obviously uh, very similar to a 1099 in the way that it reports income to uh, to somebody that is then fileable on their tax return. So um, if you want to, actually, I tell you what, let's do a little qualifying. Let's 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 talk about who you are, where you come from, what your company is, and then we'll dive into the specifics of of how the uh, uh, the real estate investing stuff plays in. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so I what I what I like to tell people is uh, I'm a CPA by day and real estate investor by night. So uh, I sort of wear both hats because uh, I'm an investor myself. But uh, yeah. my my job and my passion is to actually help real estate investors on identifying ways to save taxes uh, okay. through their real estate portfolio. And um, so our, our uh, clients include both of those profiles that you talked about. Um, we have clients who are syndicators. So um, that's where we help them uh, look at strategies that they can use at the syndication level to save taxes, not just for themselves, but also for their passive investors. Um, yeah. And we also have just, you know, kind of the everyday investors, maybe someone who's a business owner or uh, someone just working a straight W-2 job, but want to be involved in real estate in a more passive capacity, um, okay. who are looking for passive investments. And um, so we advise them on, you know, what are the best ways, what are the benefits, like you were saying, of being a passive investor? And, and what does it mean to get a K-1? Because I think, like you said, a lot of people are, are very confused by that. Sometimes they see a big loss number and they sort of freak out like, oh my goodness, did I lose all my money? <laughs> Um, so we go through and kind of explain to them, you know, what, what some of the, what does that mean? What are some of the benefits of that? Um, sure. but yeah, I think, you know, real estate for me, one of the reasons I started investing in real estate is, um, uh, early in my career I was working at one of the, uh, you know, big international accounting firms. And I happened to be in the real estate industry, in the real estate group and came to the realization that there's these individuals who are making a lot of money through cash flow and appreciation. <laughs> but paying very little to no taxes. Um, and so yeah. that's sort of what piqued my interest uh, in real estate. And, and I think that's such a, it's such a great part of the, the tax code that allows us to use write-offs and things like depreciation to, um, to really create you know, income and appreciation without paying a ton of taxes like we normally have to do in our job or other businesses that we might have. Sure. sure. Okay. All right. So let's, let's kind of, um, I'm trying to think about the best way to begin this discussion because, again, I, I want to keep it somewhat simple, but also I know there's very little simple when it comes to uh, income taxes and CPA type activities. It's, so I want to keep while keeping it simple. Let's not keep it simple. So tell us a little <laughs> bit. Uh, let's start with what what is a K one and what what where does the K one originate? What figures can we expect to see on there? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, even taking like one step back, you know, the, okay. the goal of real estate investing, I think for most people, right, is we want to have cash flow uh, sure. from the rental properties. And um, so hopefully, you know, enough cash, cash flow so that's another source of income or um, just, you know, on the pathway to having enough cash flow so that we could um, maybe stop working or stop working as much. And mm -hmm. the benefit of, of, of being a real estate investor is that not only can we write off a lot of expenses um, that business owners have, you know, for example, um, business meals, business travel, home office, and, you know, the, the list goes on and on. But we also yeah. get what's called depreciation, right? So a, a depreciation is um, the IRS's way of allowing us to take a deduction uh, for a part of the purchase price of a particular building. Uh, yep. of your investment property. So, you know, if it's a single family home, for example, if we bought a building and for $100,000, we can write off that $100,000 slowly over time. And yep. when, it ta when we talk about syndications and multifamily and, um, you know, self-storage or mobile home parks, it's the same concept, but just supersized. So, so instead yep. of a $100,000 property, we're now talking 500, a million, $5 million worth of real estate. But the concept is the same, which is that, the goal is we want to create cash flow and appreciation, but when it comes to tax time, we have all these various write-offs so that we're either not paying taxes on all that rental income, or we might even be creating a loss, in which case yep. then the, the next strategy is, well, how do we use that loss to offset you know, other rental income or other syndications or maybe you know from, from a job or something like that? Okay. Um, what I like about syndications, you know, I myself, I, I invest in single family homes, um, you know, small duplexes. I also am a passive investor in syndication. So I get to see both sides and there, there's definitely sure. pros and cons sure. to both. What I love about being a passive investor in syndications is that, you know, not only am I able to access these larger, better deals that I probably would not be able to take down on my own, right? Like Amanda probably is not going to go out and buy a $20 million property myself, <laughs> um, unless yeah. if I stop working, right? <laughs> um, yes. So I get to leverage the expertise and experience um, and the scalability of the sponsor group to help me get into those deals. Um, and it kind of works exactly the same way on the tax side in that if all I'm doing is passive investing, there's not too much I need to do on my tax return. I will get the benefit of some of these more advanced strategies like you know, accelerating depreciation and things like that, because a sure. lot of that work is done at the syndication level. So what happens is, you know, the syndication typically is going to be some kind of an LLC partnership and they will utilize all these strategies. So let's say I have a, you know, $50,000 cash flow, they'll do all the magic or their CPA, right? will do all the magic so that when I get the K1, which is showing my percentage of, you know, income or losses or whatnot, um, generally it's already, um, after all the benefits have been presented. So I frequently see clients who, you know, maybe get a, a $20,000 check, a distribution from the syndication, but also pay no taxes on that money. Um, okay. It's also a common misconception. I often, sometimes I have clients call me who say, hey, Amanda, I invested in ABC syndication. Um, you know, I, I got a check for $20,000. So let's make sure I pay taxes on that. I just want to let you know. So I tell them, well, just because you got a check doesn't necessarily mean you have to pay taxes on it. Oftentimes, sure. you might get a distribution check, but also have a tax write off, right? Yep. Um, so that's the beauty of being part of a, a, a syndication and having a syndication that invests in real estate. You're getting the benefit without having to do too much work on your end to actually get that benefit. So uh, I'm of the. I'm of the mindset, and of course, I think there's probably the listeners or a good bit of them are of the same mindset that typically um, when the pendulum swings one way at the bottom, it's going the other way at the top, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we start talking about depreciation, we start taking depreciation from the equation. So we made X amount of dollars in, in distributions, and we've gotten X amount of dollars in, in uh, uh, depreciation. Now, how does that, because when the asset is sold, is that, does that same, does that, does that capital gain pass through come the same as the depreciation pass through? Yes. So that's a really great question. And this is um, sort of a, 
a somewhat of a misconception I hear sometimes, not on the syndication level, but more for people who kind of, you know, maybe smaller single family or just their own rental properties. I often come across investors who don't take depreciation because maybe a CPA has advised like, hey, don't take depreciation because if you do, you're going to have to pay more taxes later. Um, mm -hmm. It's really, really important to understand that depreciation actually is not a choice. The IRS actually requires you to take that write off. So okay. if you're someone whose CPA says don't take the depreciation because later you have to pay that in taxes, um, the main thing to understand is regardless of whether you take depreciation or not, eventually when you sell the property, the IRS will treat it as if you took depreciation. Okay, sure. so so there's sure. no reason not to take it. But yeah, if we go over like a really simple example, I bought a property for $100,000, I wrote off 20,000 of depreciation. So now my cost basis is 80, right? Because I already wrote off 20. Eventually when I sell that property for $100,000, I'm gonna have a gain because my basis yep. is 80, I sold it for 100, there's 20,000 20, of gain. Um, yep. So, but this is not as scary as what people make it seem because if I am gonna own my property for several years, even five years, right? Mm -hmm. I generally wanna take a write off now so I can save taxes now, keep my money, reinvest it, and have it grow for the next five right. years, even if I'm gonna have to pay that back, right? When I sell the property in the form yeah. of tax. So, um, and also too, um, for some people, Sometimes the write-off might be saving me taxes at, you know, 35, 37% tax rate. When mm -hmm. eventually when I pay it back, I may be paying it back at much lower rate. And so sure. not only is there time value in saving the money, but also there's benefits in terms of just maybe getting a lower overall rate across multiple years too. And I guess it also opens the door for 1031 exchange, which um, again, you'd have to move I guess you'd have to move all of the capital gain and every day. And I don't think that does, does the 1031 exchange cover the depreciation as well as the capital gain? Yeah, for the most part, let's say um, you sell a property. Um, if you're doing the 1031 exchange correctly, you can typically defer the entire gains. So meaning you don't have to worry about depreciation recapture. Okay. Now, the caveat I'm saying is doing it correctly, because unfortunately, we do see 1031 exchanges gone bad, sort of. Um, but yep. yeah, as long as you're doing proactive planning, you know, the best time to talk to your tax advisor is before you sell a property, right? So you yep. say, hey, I'm considering selling a property. What is my gain? What are the strategies or options I can utilize to offset the capital gains? You know, we yep. frequently have clients who, um, you know, invest in a single family home that they're selling. And so maybe one strategy is to do a 1031 exchange. Um, but yep. we also have people who are like, you know, maybe I don't want to buy more real estate or maybe there's not a lot of deals available. So maybe instead of a 1031 exchange, they might invest some of that money into a syndication. And if yep. the syndication is kicking off losses, maybe those can help balance out and you know help to defer, say, some taxes as well. So there's a lot of strategies when you work with your tax person proactively before something happens versus... Um, if you talk to your CPA after you've sold a property, <laughs> there are very few things, you know, few strategies, yeah. I guess, that could be done at that time. Yeah, you're you're kind of locked up there. But you know, and that's the that brings to, that brings another good point when when you say you use the term strategies. And of course, as a marketer, again, which I, I so often refer to on the show, is 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 we're marketers at heart, or I am. Um, it's difficult to 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 scale or to to put into um, the reasonable enough terms, an explanation for how this is going to save you taxes. When in fact, I really should just be saying it's going to depend on your strategy, but this should save you taxes. So, so the strategy, I think as long as you're going into sign strategies can change obviously, but as long as you're going into something with the clear mindset of, Hey, these are the ideas, this is the strategy we're going to take. And then at the end, or, or at least along the way, know that maybe this might could change a little bit and we could have a little wiggle room. But but at the end of the day, you're still saving taxes. So so we're always torn between the idea of, of, of being able to scale our message while telling people that they can save money on taxes and then coming back and saying, hey, this is more really more of an individual type scenario because everything can change and yeah. it's going to depend on what your strategy is. Yeah. And that's exactly right. You know, um, the, the tax strategy for every person is going to be different. You know, even someone sure. who, even if both of you are making a hundred thousand dollars of income, it could be very different. Um, and, and so yes, the strategy is sort of ever changing. You know, we yep. might come into a deal thinking, okay, we're going to hold it for five years and we're going to sell, 
but we might sell in year two because you know we got a really great offer and so sure. so so that's an example of the strategies changing but also in addition to just our strategy is changing. The tax law is ever changing, yep. um, especially in the last couple of years. You know, I've, I've I've been on podcasts where by the end of the podcast, um, everything I said was no longer true. You know, within a forty minute frame, it's like, oh, actually, yep. yeah, they just signed some new stuff, and now this is outdated. Um, and I think yep. you know one of the main reasons that a lot of investors or just people in general overpay their taxes is because taxes are complicated. And, yep. you know, we don't want to seem like a dummy, like we don't understand. We're just asking maybe, you know, stupid questions. And so people tend to, you know, try to kind of avoid and not think about it until April when we have to pay. Um, yep. But really tax planning doesn't have to be complicated at all. I think what I always tell, at least for our clients, I always tell them, you know, you don't have to understand what to, you know, all the strategies, like how do I do depreciation? How do I calculate this and that? That's not your job as an investor. Really your main job as an investor is simply to keep that line of communication open with your tax advisor. Um, like yep. it's very simple, you know, Hey Amanda, I might sell this property. What should I do? You know, I might want to refinance that property or which one of the two is better. And from there, it's your CPA's job to help guide you through the different options, looking at the numbers, and then you just have to make the decision which one makes the more sense for me, tax savings, you know, practically speaking and things like that. So that's really yeah. the, ask the right question. Everybody, I think some people want to be like this. I know when I first graduated college and I first started working, like I wanted to to set my situation up where I didn't have to pay any taxes. And that worked great. It worked great when you're making very little money. But as you start making income, you you realize that it's inevitable that these, that this tax liability is going to come one way or, or the other, it's going to come whether, and then even, even when you start looking at doing 1031s on the capital gains, and then you still, it, it only makes sense to do a 1031 into something that's producing income. And when you do that and it's producing income, then you pay taxes on that income and you deferred the, 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 whatever, you know, you deferred the, uh, the tax payment on the capital gain. But so when you start looking at these things and the 1031 exchange, and then you start adding in, so the K, let's go back to the K one and say, okay, so, so we have a syndication that has, uh, five partners, a hundred thousand uh, dollar, uh, in a hundred thousand dollar property, each partner invested $4,000. So they're equal partners on the 20%. And does the depreciation of that property pass through pro rata to each investor on the K-1? Yeah, generally speaking, um, the depreciation, all income and expenses will pass through pro rata. Um, now, of course, with anything in taxes, there are strategies where you can do some sort of special allocation between the partners um, if it provides a better benefit. Um, but that's not something that's, you know, suggested on, you know, like a blanket suggestion on a webinar sure, sure, because there are a yeah. lot of downsides to consider as well in doing special allocation. But yes, you know, typically if you have an entity with five partners, um, typically those losses depreciation will be allocated amongst the partners based on their ownership percentage. And then once okay. it gets to the partners, whether one partner, how much taxes partner one versus partner two will save in taxes that part is going to be based on their personal situation and what else they have going on, what other income they have and yeah. how much income well, they and have. That comes back to that overall strategy again, where you, like you said, you can't just make a blanket statement and say, yes, you will, or no, you won't now, um, because that wouldn't make any sense. But so uh, in most assets, let me correct me if I'm wrong, but are they depreciated over 27 and a half years or is that just single family? I, I, I'm trying to sit here and recall. Yeah, great question. So uh, for residential real estate, which would be single family duplexes, even apartments, right? Those are residential properties. Usually okay. those are 27 and a half years. Um, okay. Commercial properties, it, you know, in, in the tax world, commercial would be shopping centers, medical building, office buildings. The buildings of those are usually over 39 years. Um, 30. So I know sometimes, you know, as investors, we typically associate that with loans, right? Like an apartment building is a commercial loan, but it's not a commercial property for tax purposes. It's sure. for residential real estate. Um, what's really great about depreciation is, you know, oftentimes when we look at people's tax returns, um, they are taking the 27 and a half or 39 year building depreciation. That's the standard, you know, slow and steady depreciation. 
Uh, but sure. currently we have what's called bonus depreciation. So for some of these assets that you're utilizing for your investment properties, you don't have to wait 27 and a half years to take it, right? Some of those assets we might be right, able to write off immediately in the first year through okay. bonus depreciation. And um, the, the concept of it in, in the tax world is called cost segregation or accelerated depreciation. And this okay. is where um, a cost segregation expert can come and help review your particular building or particular rental property and help you figure out for that building, what is it made up of? How much in special plumbing? How much in you know um, flooring and cabinets? And with that, create faster depreciation rather than okay. waiting 27 and a half years. So on these cost segregations, is that, you said, is that a third party that, that like the taxpayer would hire to go out and give you a report, let's just say on that. And then you use that report to couple that with your tax return and then you send it on through. Exactly. So and how does that, how, how, how does, how far does that shave the 27 and a half years down or how far potential does it have? Yeah, it really, so it's going to really depend on the property itself. Um, but you know, on average, we see maybe about 30% of the building purchase oh, wow. price as a first year deduction. So yeah, so you know, I mean, a $100,000 property might be a $30,000 bonus depreciation from sure. the cost segregation in the first year. And again, some are higher, some are lower. Um, but so it does typically or what we recommend is that as an investor, you hire or your CPA can help you hire a, a cost segregation firm. And what that firm does is they will do the special engineering breakout of the building. And once they have that broken out, then your CPA will use that information to calculate the faster depreciation using tax law. So it's two parties, right? It's your CPA as well as a cost segregation firm that does kind of the engineering breakout. I have come across um, investors whose CPAs will actually do the breakout. Um, but I always tell people, unless your CPA also has sort of an engineering degree or engineering background, uh, which I certainly don't, um, then I wouldn't recommend the CPA do it because there's two, you know, sure. there's two technical abilities that need to happen there. Sure. And is that auditable? Uh, is a is a cost segregation analysis auditable if 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 somebody were to determine that maybe somebody fudged quite a bit or something like that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just like with anything on the tax return, um, a tax return could be audited and the IRS could challenge the cost segregation as well. Um, okay. You know, but if you're working with a reputable CPA and a reputable cost segregation firm, um, what they should do, they should stand behind their numbers. Right? That's the purpose of what you're paying them is that they have the documentation to support how they arrive at those numbers. Um, you know, thankfully in our firm, we don't come across a ton of IRS audits. I just keep my fingers crossed and I say that not to jinx myself. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely knock on some wood for sure. Hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled Five Must Know Keys to Success in Passive Real Estate Investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. So I want to chat real quick. I, I, now, where I where I come from, I come from a pretty heavy agricultural background, um, and of course that that always lends itself to um, obviously you can't depreciate land, uh, and a lot of times an accountant uh, will make you on your depreciation. They come up with a um, with an amount that, or like you pay, uh, let's just say you pay a million dollars for a building. Um, I've always been told now, of course, this is, I think, again, this is situational, but you want to leave a little bit off of your overall depreciation for the land itself, correct? Yeah, definitely. And that is also um, property specific too, right? So um, if you, you know, if you bought a, a, a property that is inland, um, you know, outside of the city, probably allocate very little to land. If your property okay. is beachfront, oceanfront, downtown, then yep. probably a much larger piece of that purchase price is going to be allocated to land. So, yeah, that is part of the overall planning as well for a newer investor trying to decide, you know, which of these three properties should I buy? That, sure. that does come into play, too. And then that leaves that leaves you a little un, un, 
a little unproportioned um, basis in the property too, I guess, really. Um, the other thing, of course, with, with that goes along with agricultural land, a lot of times if there's some old barns and stuff like that, I think people have been known to to attach some some of the overall cost of the land itself. They attach a basis to the the buildings or the the outbuildings and i think agriculture actually takes on a different a different type of uh accelerated depreciation um i, I think there's a little little more um i think they're a little more liberal with allowing some of that accelerated depreciation to take place earlier um than they are later uh, specifically on ag yeah and the same thing with, like for uh, mobile home parks too right mobile yeah. home parks okay. and a lot of what we own is the land um, which land itself is not depreciable, but land improvements, right? Most yep. mobile home park owners, we own the land improvements as well as the homes, right? The mobile homes yep. themselves. And, and so in breaking out all those and doing an analysis, but yeah, general, the general uh, goal is to allocate as little to land as reasonably possible, more to yep. the building, more to the land improvements and being able to accelerate write-offs now rather than waiting for 27 and a half years. Sure, sure. Well, then accelerate the write-offs again because you want to take care of your tax bill today, not next year, not the year after, not 20 years down the road. Unless some people do plan for that, obviously I am not necessarily one of them that plans for uh, anything about I'm trying to reduce my liability today and then live for live to fight another day, right? And that, that's pretty much the, the go for. But again, you know, once you kind of become resound to the fact that, hey, these taxes are something that we're going to pay, we're going to have to pay, there's really not any way uh, specifically around paying taxes, although there might be some work throughs and some workarounds to, to, to reduce your liability, you're never going to 100% reduce that. That just kind of comes with the territory. So um, with all that being said, what is, so when, so, so when somebody comes into a syndication and they start looking at these, the, the, this K1 and they get these pass throughs that everything kind of just passes through. So, and that's, that's pretty much what it is, right? I mean, you take all the expenses. So, so the, 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 the investor, they get a percentage of the expenses, not just, we've talked a lot about depreciation, but like if, if we went and, and, and hired a secretary that had to work at the, at the building, they would get a certain percentage of, of, what, of what the cost for her is and the certain percentage of the cost of the ink pens to operate the business and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, from a K, the K-1 itself will show that investor's you know, allocated portion of total income minus total expenses of the company. And a lot of syndications um, actually uh, have fees that they pay, right? Not just the property manager, but also to the sponsor group, you know, acquisition sure. fees, asset management fees, um, and the investors K-1 also show that as part of the deduction and the write-offs too, so. Um, and that gets split up on a pro rata, mm -hmm. a pro rata share, correct? Yeah, typically, yeah, typically speaking, that's, that's sure. how it works. Um, you know, it's interesting you brought up the fact that, you know, taxes are uh, unavoidable, um, but that may not be the case. It depends. <laughs> it depends yep. on the structure. You know, we have clients who um, make a ton of money, you know, over a million dollars um, and they don't pay any taxes at all. Haven't oh, paid yeah. taxes in years. Um, <clears throat> and uh, but we also have people who make a million dollars and pay more than half of that to taxes. Yep. And so what's important is not the amount of money that's being made, but the type of income that's being made, right? So, yeah. so you know, a high level example, you're someone working a W-2 job, you made a million dollars, you are going to pay taxes, right? More, most likely than not. Again, there's always loopholes where that person might not pay tax, but generally speaking, that person is going to pay some tax. You yeah. make a million dollars in real estate, highly likely that you could pay little to no taxes because of all these other strategies that we're talking about. I mean, even with you know, 1031 exchange that we we're talking about earlier, we're not getting rid of the tax, we're just kicking the can down the road. At some point, yeah. you might pay the tax. But what if you passed away with the real estate in your name or in your trust, right? Yeah. Current law says once we pass away, we get what's called step up basis. So mm -hmm. our kids might inherit all of that without any tax. And we haven't paid any tax. And in addition, now, we is, that off all the basis, is that is that governed by a certain, do they only allow a certain amount of stepped up basis or is that infinite? No, under current law, there is no limit on that. So I buy something for a dollar, it's worth $10 million when I pass away. 
then I don't have to pay any taxes on all that. Your your the inheritance. So I guess I guess that's the the benefit of dying in a way is is that uh, that your kids or whoever you're inherited gets a it gets a stepped up basis. So yeah, yeah, and it is a mistake we see a lot. You know, sometimes we have um, clients who are elderly or their parents are elderly, and the parents want to start you know passing assets down to yep. their kids. And it's something that's very tricky that we have to talk to them about. Like, hey, if, you know, if mom or dad gives this to you now, you're going to have to pay taxes on it at some point when you sell. But if they hold on to it for a couple more years and you inherit the property, then maybe as a family, we don't have to pay any taxes. Right? So, so you get step basis then divide it up then instead of right. instead of doing it then. So, yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of strategy and everything. You know, you hate to, to just strategize your whole life away, but you, you really you have to take some of these things into account, especially as you build wealth, because the last thing you want to do is is build all this wealth only to for your children to have to turn around and and um, hand it to the government or hand half of it to the government or then struggle to pay the taxes on it uh, and, and, and end up forcibly losing it. For, for one reason or another. So anyhow, but yeah. all right, well, listen, as we're running out of time here, I want to ask you a couple of questions. It's what we ask every guest that comes on. Um, what is the best book that you've ever read or are currently reading? If, if that's the best book, can I say my book or no? <laughs> yeah, go for it. I, yeah. If that's, go, yes, absolutely. Uh, no. well, how about how about you tell us the best book you've ever written and uh, 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 read, and then we'll give, a plug for your book on the best book you've ever written. Yes, yes, I love that. Um, so one of I have so many favorite books. It's hard to it's hard to pinpoint down to one. But one of my favorite books is uh, How to Build a Business, Not a Job by David mm -hmm. Eagle. Um, and uh, I, it's really helped me tremendously in, in my accounting firm as well as for my real estate business. And just in everything I do, looking for ways to automate, systematize, or delegate um, uh, the tasks, right? So I have more time to do kind of big picture and planning and things like that. So that's a book I, I highly recommend for business owners as well as just real estate investors. Um, sure. uh, my favorite book that I ever wrote, <laughs> I like that question, um, there you go. is uh, Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. And awesome. um, you can find that just on Amazon. Um, and it's a compilation of actual client stories uh, that my husband and I have experienced over the years in working with real estate investors. So we share stories about how people have effectively uh, saved taxes, um, as well as how people have messed up big time uh, in using yep. the wrong strategies or no strategies. So um, definitely. no strategy has got to be a big one, I would think, because <laughs> a lot of people just go into things and they see uh, piles of money at the end of the rainbow and they just don't ever they just don't pay any attention. I think I think a lot of times you see that with especially lottery winners and stuff like that, people that 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 maybe necessarily needed somebody to guide them a little bit like what you're talking about. So, all right. So what is the best trip you have ever taken or hope to take like a dream vacation or something like that? Oh my gosh. Um, so many great trips. I think one of my favorite ones was uh, when I went on an Alaskan cruise with my grandma, oh, wow. my family when I was in college. Um, I didn't know what to expect. Um, I just em envisioned like a ship with a bunch of old retired people <laughs> um, which was actually what it ended up being. Um, but the, you know, the, the scenery, the excursions we did, was just really beautiful and relaxing. Sure. And I, I wasn't really a nature person until yep. I kind of experienced Alaska. That's awesome. Yeah. Alaska, they say, will turn you into a nature person. I, oh. I, uh, I think it would be very, very neat to see. So, um, all right. So if the listeners heard something today that they would like to reach out to you about, or maybe get some, 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 some information on, or, or even possibly even speak with you about having you guide them or hire you or some other capacity, what is the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, I think the best place to find me is actually on uh, my website. It's www.keystonecpa.com. And um, we actually have a free downloadable ebook for any of you who, you know, if you don't want to buy the book from Amazon, we have a, a kind of a mini version. And we talk okay. a lot about different strategies for investors. Um, you know, what type of legal entity should you have? How do you pay your kids and take a tax write off for your real estate? Um, you know, what's the most common tax mistake for investors? And uh, so, yeah, you can go down, go there to our website at keystonecpa.com and download the book. And I, I try to put uh, tax updates on our site as well. So definitely check that out. 
Now, real quick, can you can you name the title of the book one more time? Uh, yes, Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. Cool deal, cool deal. Amanda, I can't thank you enough for coming on here. I know it's it's tough to uh, take tax strategies and tax discussion and pep it up into an enjoyable topic, um, but I, I feel like you did a superb job of that. And and really, uh, again, if we can just help somebody that, that or at least get somebody in touch with you that maybe needs some help. So um, either way, I want to thank you again for being on here and uh, thank everybody out there in uh, listener land for listening to us today. And Amanda, thanks again. Cashflow Pro is hosted by Casey Brown, founder and CEO of 3000 Capital, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long-term wealth. If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.